Greetings, and welcome to Examples of Mass Culture Theory. Uh, this mini-lecture is part of a series on what is mass culture theory, uh, and it's part of a collection of videos that are for a course, Popular Culture in the U.S. In this video, we're just going to take a look at a few examples of mass culture theory at work, and just just to get a sense of where we see it. I mean, there's plenty within the other videos that I identify um, of this concept at work, but I just wanted to identify a few that we may be a little bit more familiar with and not realize it. So the first, th the first thing we'll look at is Americanization. And we've heard, you know, we've heard this term a lot. Another, you know, we could also say globalization, but particularly Americanization and the critiques of it are often seen or discussed as a, a representation of mass culture theory and action. That is this idea that Americanization, the idea of um, cultural elements from the United States being, you know, mass exported to other countries and thereby diminishing local culture in place of American culture. So this is something that has that came came about as a result of World War II, largely. It certainly there was a lot there was large exports prior, but we really see the explosion of exports of of companies and products of America or of the United States really happen after World War II. And much of that has to do with kind of the dynamics of World War II and where it was fought. Uh, and the fact that the United States didn't really fight on the U.S. territory. So there was a, the, our industry, the resources, all of those things were ready to go right at the end of the war versus many countries that were involved. The fighting was happening on their their ground, so there's a lot of infrastructure and a lot of things that need to be re uh, needed to be fixed and improved. And the United States was able to kind of get footholds in many countries at this time. But we see Americanization as this, you know, as this diluting of culture, uh, as this kind of mass cultural product that devalues or, or seen as devaluing. And one of the that common characteristics or, or categorizations of Americanization is that it's the lowest common denominator. That is, it is, you know, it it is not quality as we've talked about, like within mass culture theory. It is not of elite culture, but it is the cheapest, quickest, easiest, simplest um, way of doing things. So it's cheap toys or cheap food or, um, you know, poor quality food, but lots of it. So this is one of the critiques or one of the views of Americanization as a, you know, as a cultural force throughout the world. And that it often dilutes local culture that, you know, the, you know, the, the dynamic here, and again, we can hear this um, as mass culture theory, is that local culture is pure and authentic and valued and Americanization uh, comes in and dilutes that and destroys it and replaces it with mass product mass produced items or mass produced services so a good example of that is of course Walmart which has over 8500 stores in 15 countries and the idea that a Walmart comes in and the ways in which Walmart you know provides all of these all of these goods quite cheaply because they're mass produced on such a scale that they can be sold cheaply and again people start to argue that this is a diluting of culture that what people do and buy and experience at Walmart is less valuable than if they go into a crate and barrel or they go into another type of uh, more refined experience you know this might be a difference between say Abercrombie and Fitch and Walmart the expectation of value although even Abercrombie and Fitch would be considered an Americanizing tool, so you might find, you know, a local tailor versus the clothes you might buy at Walmart. And the idea is that you can't get the same experience at Walmart as you may get at some of these other places, and therefore Walmart is less valuable. It's pop culture. It's mass-produced. It's unwanted. Another good ex example is, of course, McDonald's with 30,000 restaurants in over 119 countries. Uh, and the idea is that you know again it's cheap food it's it, it's it's paltry food it's it's a very anesthetized experience you know you go in you get your food you either sit you take it to go um, you get cheap toys right the the little toys with happy meals and stuff like that but 
and here's where we see a, a, a kind of a response to that concern about Americanization. We talk about McDonald's as this, you know, as this pop culture experience. It's less value, um, and according to mass culture theory, you know, it doesn't. It's not worth it. But the reality is, it's a very different than. It, it's much more complex than just saying, you know, people going to McDonald's. It, it's a it's a waste of time. And here's where it starts to get different. So in the United States, McDonald's doesn't serve beer. But McDonald's serves beer at, at the McDonald's in Greece. So how does the eating experience for people change when you can serve beer at McDonald's? It is a different dining experience. No, it's not necessarily dining at a, you know, a very elite restaurant, but it is still not as irrelevant as people might post or believe it to be in, as it is in the US. So this it starts to get more complicated. What happens when McDonald's is in India and it's now having to come up with new menu items because a large percentage of the Indian population does not eat beef. And that's a you know that's a large chunk of what McDonald's serves. So you get new menu items. You get things at these McDonald's you cannot get elsewhere. So it's it's useful to realize and think about um, you know as we talk about mass culture theory and its critiques and this idea of it dilutes but it doesn't necessarily it can actually create new and rich experiences for people because it's it is not just a replication it is not just mindless experiences there are people that have rich experiences in these environments what did mcdonald's mean to russia when the first mcdonald's was, were opening up in the in the night early 1990s people were lined up all around the street people were willing to pay I mean, what happens, you know, people were paying a month's income to eat at McDonald's. And if you're paying a month's income to eat at McDonald's, again, the eating experience becomes very different than if you're paying with the change you found in your sofa. Uh, so just keep this in mind that as we're looking at these examples and kind of what popular or what that mass culture theory tells us or, you know, it argues, um, it's still way more complicated than that. Whole Foods, as you can see, I'm on a food kick. Whole Foods is a really good example of what might be considered elite culture within mass culture theory, right? Whole Foods is considered elite in a lot of ways, in the ways it lays out its environment, you know, as opposed to other uh, other food uh, other food markets and, and things like that. It's you know, it, it creates this ambiance, this this cult, you know, that it's 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 a step above, and it's also more expensive, right? There's a there's a running joke that you know people don't call Whole Foods Whole Foods they call it Whole Paycheck because for many people if they wanted to buy what they wanted to buy at Whole Foods as opposed to what they buy at other places they're spending a whole paycheck uh, because things are tend to be more expensive. In that Whole Food going to Whole Foods is an experience, right? It's not just you go and you get food as you do at some places, but it's an experience. There's all sorts of things there to enhance the experience. Some Whole Foods have a little food bar that you can chill out. You can get a meal. Uh, you can sit down and eat that meal. You can taste and sample things. You know, they have these little bars where you can actually try samples. Um, but it's supposed to be an experience. It's not just you go and get food. And there's an element of utopia about Whole Foods, right? The, you walk in and, and so many of the things around you are presented in a way in which, you know, all you need to do is eat these types of foods and, and experience these types of uh, body washes and your life will be perfect or you could live forever. There's this idea that the, the value embedded in Whole Foods isn't just in giving you calorie healthy calories to sustain yourself but there's almost a sense of immortality there's a sense of this is you know this is the life after and so all of these things contribute to whole foods certainly being uh to some degree higher up on that uh in that hierarchy of culture uh that mass culture theory would consider this higher in cultural value and more important than other food chains Right? It could be considered an elite space, a space for, of course, people of the elite culture and others, but not everybody can access it, they can't afford it, or can fully appreciate it. So here's another interesting example of mass culture theory at work. And we hear all of these things in the ways in which Whole Foods is described. We see this in where Whole Foods 
get built. You don't see Whole Foods getting built in more urban, um, middle to lower working class environments. They get made, but they get made in places that are, you know, that cater to upper, either upper middle class or upper class. And that, you know, that tells us something about the nature of who Whole Foods customer or what, where Whole Foods sits within that hierarchy. All right, that's all for now. Thank you very much for watching, and I will see you in the next lecture.